Okay. Hi, everybody. I hope your lambing and kidding is going well. Um, I'm just going to share um, a little experience with how we're starting to branch out and how we use electronic ID as far as trying to increase efficiency for capturing some of these official ID numbers and generating a list as Dan alluded to and giving that list to the auction market. And so all this came about for us because we take some light lambs to some special sales in Fenimore, Wisconsin. And the woman who runs the sale barn there um, says we don't unload, not us specifically, but any sheep or goat producer without giving them the list of official uh, scrapey tag numbers. And so I'm um, sometimes the lone wolf, but we don't really enjoy tagging our animals to be quite honest. It's, um, um, you know, sheep don't like being tagged uh, unless they're little lambs, then it's a lot easier. And so these might be 85 pound um, fat happy lambs. And so they don't really like being tagged. It gets a little hard on your hands year after year, um, but it's a requirement it has to be done. So um, this might be a trailer load of lambs. Uh, I can't tell you what those weigh because I don't remember in that picture. But if we sell as we do sometimes direct to slaughter, well then we don't have to scrapey tag them. They're going from our farm to get on a semi to go to Superior uh, in uh, just around Denver, Colorado and, and be um, harvested there. But as Dan said, there's a pretty strong market for lighter lambs like, well, I don't want to tell you how to market your lambs, but these might be going 75 to 100 pounds and um, bringing as much or more money than 135 pound lamb. And it's kind of an odd thing that's happened here um, of late. But um, and so if we take those, they've got to have a scrapey tag. And um, we often, if they don't have tags, because on our um, pasture lambing flock, we don't tag everything. We only tag a subset. Um, then, then they're going to get tagged either in a chute or often squished up here on the in the trailer. And so, over the years, um, we've primarily used Shearwell tags as RFID tags. And I just want to be fair that there are some other. Um, RFID or electronic ID tags. Sorry, I'm going to use RFID and EID um, interchangeably. Um, and so I don't know if the mouse always shows on these Zoom calls, but this is the tag that we've used, the one on, on your left, uh, and been really uh, pretty happy with it. There is no tag that has 100% reception, I mean, retention or 100% readability, but this one is. Um, really the highest that I have ever experienced. Uh, and also, I love how this tag just goes in like a little piece of butter right into that lamb's ear, whether it's a, a full-size lamb, whether it's a 75-pound lamb, or it's a 10-pound baby lamb. It just goes in quite nicely, um, and your hands are not paying you back the next day with the arthritis. Um, these other tags are other manufacturers. I tried to put in there the text of who they come from. Um, and and um, as far as from a scrapey standpoint, um, Shearwell has approval. And I know Allflex either has approval or is working on getting approval as an official scrapey tag with their RFID tags. Um, I'm just going to move along. Sorry. Well, maybe I'll go back there. So these would be some of our lambs. Um, and they are wearing uh, uh, official scrapey uh, visual tag in one ear and their RFID tag in their other ear. Uh, th these particular set of lambs, uh, we collect data on them, um, not from a research standpoint, but for a selection standpoint as far as growth rate and muscling. And so we need to know who they are or they're useless in our selection program. So double tagging has worked the best for us in, in that regard and also paying attention to how um, what the hay feeder looks like. Um, uh, we're in Minnesota, so if they can visit snow fence, sheep will do a great job of tearing out their tags. So just making sure that fences are, are sheep and tag friendly. But on to my topic. 
Um, as you see in the left is a blue handled wand reader. And um, that um, reader I uh, have just purchased about 18 months ago now. And to be quite honest, I wished I'd own it the whole time I had been working with um, EID tags, which I think is probably about six or seven years now, as far as in our own sheep. Um, and why do I like this tag reader? Um, well, I like it because I can rely on it to work every single time I need it. And I'm not always the um, most focused person. So sometimes I forget to charge things. And so this reader will doesn't need to be charged up very often. Um, it retains its battery life quite well. Um, if And I'm not doing commercial, I'm just sharing the, the attributes as I have experienced them. If we do forget to charge it and we need it to, which I yet have had to use this, but it does have a um, charging unit that can be hooked up to your truck. So that's really nice because we all still have cigarette lighters in our trucks, even though um, most of us don't smoke. Um, we can store a whole boatload of tags numbers in, in this reader. Um, it works on all tag types that I have. And I have um, a number of different um, tags in my sheep um, just because I find EID tags quite interesting. And so sometimes I'll bring some back um, years ago when I went to England. Um, it's really super easy to use. You know, you basically just um, put that reader right up against the tag when the sheep are in a pen or crowded up on a trailer or in a chute. It's very easy to uh, like tap the tag with the end of the wand and then you've got it read. It makes a little noise that even I can still hear um, that it had it read. And then we can send that list once you're done reading the group of animals uh, to your phone. Um, and then from there, we just send it back to our computer or print it right from our phone and we give it to the um, auction um, that we go to that requires us to give them a list. So that's something I didn't experience five years ago, never had to give anybody any of the data that we're supposed to collect. Um, but I do I foresee the future going that way? I kind of do. Um, so we made a couple videos um, the other day for to share with you. Um, so this is just a short video. Sorry for all the mess around our shoot, but Jordan's just tapping these tags um, and reading them. Uh, okay. And then moving along, um, we're going to try to show you how we make a list. Um, sometimes I forgot how to do it because it might be two, three months since I made it. And uh, my memory's not what it was when I was 20. Uh, so I just have to go to the Shearwell um, phone app that's on my phone and we're looking at uh, Jordan's phone right here, but, um, um, and remind myself how to send that list um, that we made to myself. But um, even me, who's not the most tech savvy, we can do it. So we made this video, um, I hope it'll play. So 163 animals. Load. Okay, now you want to call it, what you want to rename it to flock inventory? Sure. March 2021. Okay, now let's see if we can maybe maybe send it to us. Okay, 
Okay, and so just so you could believe me, um, I printed that list um, and just took a picture of part of it so you could see all those um, IDs are right there and uh, it would kind of save the auction barn a step um, to know that those animals came in from us on whatever day we were to take them there or I could give it to her electronically. I apologize that I left a, another um, decimal point there that was kind of unnecessary. So um, some of you know me, a lot of you don't know me, but um, I am a proponent of electronic ID uh, in the future uh, or now and moving to the future. But I also am a practical sheep and goat producer. And, and um, so I feel like it has to be easy, which is what I mean by user-friendly. It has to be beneficial to our business and Dan did an outstanding job illustrating how that could be. Has to be animal friendly. So I can remember years ago when we had tags that um, weren't always animal friendly, like maybe they didn't want to go in right the first time, maybe they caused some infection, etc. cetera. Um, so easy to apply tags that are animal friendly and inert. Um, and we need to have flexibility. Um, I apologize for my dogs, but I think um, that's my husband's way of maybe telling me he's hungry, um, is ignoring the dogs. Um, and so some producers are going to prefer uh, some manufacturers tags and types over others. Um, and I think any kind of system that we use for official ID and recording, we have to design it and make it work for the main scenarios that are out there and all the little nuances that are different um, flock to flock and herd to herd. We'll figure out ways to include those and make it work, but we need to start um, with you know one shoe after another and then we can make all the little pieces come together. And that is all I have, um, Travis. If Thank you, Dr. Cindy, uh, for that, uh, that presentation. And uh, we gladly appreciate uh, your guidance and information uh, on, on pulling some of that together. And uh, we will kind of dig through. And in fact, uh, several of the questions have, have been answered in the chat. Uh, and uh, Mr. Dan Persons, uh, just to, for those of you that are, are watching, uh, put there the he places the tags on the top side of the ear, fairly close, leaving enough room uh, for those uh, ears to grow on those on those lambs. There's been some uh, discussion in relation to um, the when and which lambs can and should be uh, tagged. And uh, Dr. Stacy, are you uh, able to be with us? And in fact, I'll invite all of our presenters to come back and and join us uh, via video if you can. So Dr. Stacy, uh, for, for those as we um, record this, uh, so which, which animals, maybe it's easier this way, of which animals are exempt from not having um, the scrapie identification uh, for the sheep and goats? Uh, but if not, uh, maybe it's just best that obviously people can put those tags in, but which ones don't need to have it? Great question. So in general, all sheep and goats require official identification. The exception is restricted movement feeder animals. And those animals are, there, there's a very specific definition of what a restricted movement feeder animal is. It's, it's basically sheep and goats that are being fed out for slaughter and will be slaughtered by 18 months of age. There's more details than that. For example, they um, specifically, they're less than 18 months of age, and that's evident that they have not yet had eruption of the second incisor. They're not pregnant. They've never been pregnant. Uh, they have never been commingled with breeding animals from other flocks other than the flock they were born into. And again, they'll be slaughtered by 18 months of age. So it's kind of a small group of animals. And you may be aware that there are some differences between state and federal rules. So it gets a little bit complicated when trying to discern what the rules are unless you make sure to take both of those into account. So if you're looking for bringing animals into Minnesota, 
Minnesota is always going to be the one to help you figure out requirements for coming here. But if you're bringing animals to another state, it's always going to be the state of destination to tell you what the requirements are to go there. So those states will let you know those requirements based on that combination of state and federal rules that they would take into account. But in Minnesota, if you're moving sheep or goats around in general, it's better to tag them. Um, that's the safest thing to do unless you are one of these individuals with these restricted movement feeder animals that are going direct to slaughter um, or to terminal feedlots that are permitted by the board, things like that. Okay, Stacey, and we're going to stay with you. Uh, in, in fact, you put there in the, the chat, uh, the, there's a sheep and goat uh, call line uh, that you guys have with the Board of Animal Health. Is that correct? Yeah, we have a, a dedicated phone line, which people will call with questions. And I think there was a question in the chat about how to update information that might have been previously sent to the board. Uh, so that if, if, you're, if you don't necessarily want to go through the registration form again, which that is always an opportunity, even if you previously registered, if you want to update your information and you're more comfortable with the internet, you can feel free to just fill that form out again. And we can compare that to the information that we have. Or there's that sheep and goat phone line, which is a dedicated phone line that's answered by staff who help with sheep and goat questions. And that number is 651-201-6800. Thank you, Dr. Stacy. Uh, a good question here, and um, is if I, if electronic identification uh, is in the future, uh, who will maintain the 840? And of course, 840 is uh, the designation to country uh, that it's assigned to the United States of America. Um, and so, who will uh, keep that information? Will it be state or federal? And uh, when and it says when will APHIS have EID capability? for annual certification inventory. But uh, then, then it's uh, who keeps that information and then where, where does it go in terms of inventory? I can handle the first question. I'm not sure uh, what the question is referring to with certification, but as far as how the tag numbers themselves are handled, uh, that inf all AIN or animal identification number tags are kept in a federal database and the tag manufacturers, when they send those tags out, enter those allocations into that database so the tags themselves are tracked. And then the Board of Animal Health additionally has access to that information, and we capture that in our database as well, mainly because we try to keep everything in the same place so that we can leverage our ability to respond to disease emergencies with all the information in our one database. So we are able to also look to see how these ear tags are moved around and based, um, and based on that, be able to track animals back if, if an animal um, or a tag needs to be tracked. So depending on if the tags are ready in the animal or not, but, but the tags themselves are also um, traceable, not just after they're in an animal, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stacy. And in fact, uh, Cindy, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the tag retention, and I just want to gather that just kind of from a quick approach of, um, and, and Dan said, you know, to keep it a little bit closer to the ear, but uh, I know that uh, uh, that you do see things and from an analytical standpoint. And so what, what uh, but still being applied, what, what uh, have you seen in terms of retention of good, bad, and different, and, um, or suggestions to help people out? Uh, so specific to the shearwell tag, one thing that's quite interesting, and it's probably related to our climate changes that, I mean, not climate change, I mean, the fact that in this part of the country, we have some pretty extreme temperatures and a lot of humidity, and that can affect plastic. But interesting for me in the shearwell tag realm is the tag will stay in the ear, the, especially the part that has the RFID, but it might break right here at the hinge which is kind of irrelevant because as long as the tag is still in the ear and it still reads, it doesn't matter that it looks perfect anymore, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, but as Dan said, tag placement is critical. 
um, I guess I don't think I've ever created a problem putting the tag too tight. I maybe have created too big a gap occasionally by not having it tight enough where something could get hooked on this part and it could pull it out. But again, it's pretty infrequent. Um, I'm not real good at using some um, lube with disinfectant on the pin when you place it in the ear as is recommended for visual scrapey tags. Um, but I do keep them in a sealed container so they're clean. They look clean when they go in and I think that's quite important. And I think the other thing that's helpful to me in the long run is that I primarily put them in baby lambs uh, so that ear is more of a virgin clean ear anyway. So I think that's a good idea. Is that what you asked me, Travis? That was very, that was very nice. Thank you. Uh, Dan, do you have anything or are you okay? I'm okay. I, okay. I think that tag placement is really important. Yeah. And again, what Cindy said for the shear wall tags, they do recommend the top of the ear fairly close to the head. I mean, not right up to the head, but fairly close. Um, and my shearer's comments has always been, if the shearers are cutting the tags out of your sheep, that's a shearer problem, not a tag placement problem. So that was the probably half dozen different guys that shear for me. It's, it's a shearer problem, not a tag problem. So that's their job to not cut tags out of the ears. And I can, we've probably sheared 20,000 sheep on our place in the last 20 years. And I think they've cut out two out of 20,000. I mean, they just, they leave them alone. They, they watch for my tags. Sure, and as, as long as they know where they're at, uh, that's a that's a bonus uh, of, of where those uh, tags are. And of course, it was brought up a, a little bit in the discussion that if uh, for at least for shearing as well as that the metal tags uh, can cause larger challenges than I any of the plastic options that we do have as availability because those can get caught in the um, the, the clippers and or the shears as well and, and cause problems for either the sheep or the, the shear. Um, I, I think we have a fun one here that we can discuss. Uh, and so that maybe maybe this one's a tricky one as well, but uh, the question comes up is, so what do we do with La Manchas? Um, so we, we don't have an ear. And in fact, on the other side of that one, uh, what do we do with Nubian ear tags, okay? And so um, Stacy, I don't know if you've seen some of those in terms of options with the, our La Manchas that have kind of a some smaller ears of what people do or what the suggestions may or may not be there? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, the regional epidemiologist with the United States Department of Agriculture has addressed this. And I, I could, um, it might take me a bit to find the information in writing, but he's addressed this in the past with uh, coming up with an alternative, which is not ideal, but an option, of using a dog collar where the ID tag itself is through the holes of the collar so that the collar cannot be removed without breaking the tag. Of course, you have to be cautious doing something like that because if you have a young animal that's going to grow, you don't wanna have the collar to be restrictive so that you would have to break the ear tag in order to not strangle your animal but you also don't want the collar so loose that it can slip over its head. So that was something that was actually um, addressed as an option. And the information may be available uh, on their website. I could try to see if it's on there to post in the chat as well. But that was one thing that was given as an opportunity. Since you're right, they oftentimes, they just don't have anything there in which to actually apply a tag. So if those animals are moving through concentration points, that can definitely be a struggle. If they're not moving through concentration points and they're moving farm to farm, then you would have the other options to include them if they're registered with a, a, a registry or a state issued tattoo to be able to use that as an opportunity or the implant, the A40 implants, which again, um, are official ID, but can be a little bit difficult because there's just a lot of requirements that go along with using an implant, including that they have to travel with an electronic reader and different things like that. That's the information I mentioned that is uh, outlined on the federal website. And we have a link to those requirements 
on our official ID page. Dr. Stacy, can you put the ear tag in the tail web of a La Mancha? I mean, there's nothing prohibiting us from doing that, right? Yeah, I, I have heard that in the past, but I've, I've also seen information that says an ear tag should never be applied anywhere else. So I would have to say that I would probably defer that question ultimately to our USDA friends just to make sure that there's consistent messaging there. But I'm hesitant to say anything one way or the other because it, I have seen various controversial comments on, on that. Oh, one of the uh, attendees said that uh, there's the radio frequency identification uh, leg hawk bands uh, that are currently being uh, evaluated uh, for the dairy goats in Australia. So um, appreciate that input of uh, looking to see if that, uh, that could happen. We have a good question here that I'll I'd, uh, like to grab as well. And it says, uh, what do you do if a ewe uh, that was purchased uh, and later loses her tag? Uh, so what would be the correct answer to, to kind of get that uh, documentation updated and improved? Stacy? Yeah, that's a great question because that's the reality of the situation. Animals, animals lose their ear tags. In the ideal world, if you know who that you is and you can refer to your records to find who she is and what her original ID is, then you would want to apply an official ear tag and marry it to that record so that that new tag number and the previous tag number are tied together so that we know that those belong to the same animal. So if there's any records associated with the animal under the original number, they can then be married up to this new number in the event that there's ever a disease investigation involving that animal. I know that may not always be possible. So if it's not possible to know what the original number is, then you would just want to document as much as you can in your records to indicate that the animal had lost their ID. And if you have a subset of animals, you may know it is, perhaps you can reference that somehow, but um, as much information as you can capture would be helpful for disease response, but the perfect world would say that you'd be able to marry the two numbers together if that information were available. Okay, and uh, a, a different uh, twist to it, um, but, and you, you touched on it and put a little bit in the chat, but uh, on those that were harvested at home or sold directly to the consumer, um, obviously those aren't going through the channels that we would commonly consider on production, um, but you would want to, as the producer, have some documentation as well. So uh, go ahead, Stacey, is it, and, and you also said that we could uh, discuss it and provide information from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture as well. Right. So if, you, if you're selling animals direct to the public or slaughtering at home, then you would still want to maintain the same record. So even if you're not selling the animal, you're still disposing of it. So you would still want your records for those animals that you slaughter at home to reflect that they were slaughtered at home. As far as the rules themselves or the details about what the requirements are to actually have that home slaughter or to sell the meat directly to consumers, which was part of the question, that information is interestingly enough, um, not under the Board of Animal Health's purview, so our responsibility at the board, I like to say, is to keep the animals alive until they're slaughtered. And once they get to slaughter, we have some rules that affect record keeping at slaughter plants, but the majority of the authority for slaughter is maintained with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So if there are questions specifically on rules or regulations around how selling meat direct to consumers would work, the Department of Agriculture and Dr. Nikki Neeser at the Department of Agriculture oversees that program. Thank you very, very much, um, sure. Mr. Mr. Dan Persons. Um, so a question comes for us on, first off, the what program do you use for the record keeping of withdrawal times and for pen movements? Uh, I don't know if you touched on that or not. I appreciate you sharing the barn cards and the information that um, that was available, um, but the inquiry is on withdrawal times. And then there's also an, an inquiry of, of what is the cost of the record keeping system uh, that, you've, uh, that you've utilized there with uh, your Surewell. So I use 
I use the farm works and my share well data as my record system. And integral to that system is all treatments. So we buy drugs into a medicine cabinet within the farm works software. And every time we give, and when we buy drugs into the system, part of that purchasing them into the system includes telling the system what the withdrawal days are for that particular drug. So the minute we give a shot to the animal, that withdrawal date's already established on the animal's record and becomes a part of it. And the treatment of that animal becomes a, a permanent piece of that animal's record. It doesn't go away just because the, um, because the animal was sold or died. Records are there forever, live and dead animals, and all of those medicine, medicine records, therefore, are also there. So the treatment part of it is integral to our software and integral to a, the handheld recorder we use to record all of our data on the farm. Um, that system, and I'm not sure this is the appropriate place for it, but the software and the stock recorder that we keep all of our daily records on, that system runs about $2,054 right now. So. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we had a great discussion. Uh, we do have a poll uh, that, uh, that our team at the University of Minnesota Extension has put together to evaluate if we've uh, met your expectations. And we are continuing to, uh, to work to try to provide positive experiences for you and to try to provide information for you. And in fact, uh, we're looking at, of course, as we uh, dig through to March and we will keep everyone up to date uh, with the, our plans for our April and, and upcoming functions that we do have. Um, but one of the things is, is that, um, is, is that uh, we uh, will move on with uh, our nutrition and our marketing and, and feel free to, uh, to put something in the uh, chat box as you kind of close up the evening of some things that you would like addressed uh, here with uh, the rest of our spring functions and so that we're responsive uh, to our, our sheep and goat producers. Uh, and so we kindly appreciate that. And, oh, and so, and, and thank you uh, to our, our panelists, uh, Dr. Stacy Schwabenlander, uh, Mr. Dan Persons and uh, Dr. Cindy Wolf. And so with that, we ap kindly appreciate everybody joining us and uh, look forward to uh, you joining us next year in April. And hopefully that you are having a successful or have had a successful lambing and kidding uh, season for uh, for your operations. Have a good night. Thanks so much to all of you that for joining us.